Welcome to your way to happy Bible study. I'm Lisa Dennis Sparks, and you're watching Christians United Broadcasting Network. Sorry I'm late, guys. I am in dire straits today. My, I, through the night last night, my shoulder started hurting me again. You know, the calcific tendonitis thing. The agony thing that I didn't think was going to come back till like, December. Well, I guess they meant six months for each shoulder because, uh, you know, here I am with this again. I can't even move. My daughter had to do my makeup and my hair for me and help me get dressed and everything because I can't move my right shoulder at all. It's just excruciating. So, But we're going to, I've got some really important information for you. And so nothing is going to stop me from being here. And I'm sorry I'm late. But let's get right straight into it. We're going to, um, I put a disclaimer on my wall earlier. If you scare easy, don't watch tonight, okay? Um, now, we're, we'll do Proverbs 20 first. And so you can watch that. And then I'll warn you before we go into that other part of the study. Um, it's scary, okay? And I'm kind of processing it myself. I'm learning more and more every day about these things. I'm in my room. I'm not outside this time. Uh, I can't get out of bed without help. <clears throat> can't get dressed without help. I hate that. But my daughter is, praise God, she's helped me. <laughs> she's helped me. So, uh, hi everybody, I love you, and let's go ahead and get into Proverbs chapter 20, okay? And forgive me, I don't take pain medication while I teach, so uh, I'll try not to express the agony in my shoulder very often, okay? I'll try not to express it often. Okay, um, here we go. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby really is not wise. What's that pounding? I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Let's just keep going. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. It's better if you don't drink. For some people, 
uh, they've been drinking so long that it would make you very sick to stop. If you can just slow down to where it doesn't have uh, as tight a hold on you. You know what I mean? Um, but don't go thinking that that's um, a good thing. Because alcohol is a depressant, not a stimulant. Okay? So what it's designed by God to do is to magnify your uh, the mood you already have going. It's for celebration. Okay? So if you're happy and celebratory, then uh, it enhances that. But I'll get this back. But if you're <clears throat> if you're depressed and sad, the last thing you want to do is drink because it will increase the sadness, increase the um, the anger, increase the depression, whatever it is you're feeling that's a down negative kind of thing, it's going to increase it and you don't want to increase it. Okay. You don't want to drink if, if you have a choice. Okay. I know some people have, are addicted and it's difficult for them, but if you have a choice, it's wiser not to drink. Uh, I mean, you can have one and not be terribly impaired, but beyond that, you know, it does affect you and it affects your moods. It affects uh, more than you think. Okay. And when you still think that you're maintaining, other people can see that you're wasted. Okay. So, um, it's better not, better not to go there unless you're at the wedding and drinking the King's new wine. Okay. Yeah, my daughter did the wings on me again. I didn't know what she was doing, but, you know, what can I say? Verse 2 in Proverbs chapter 20. The fear of a king is as the roaring of a lion. Whoso provoketh him to anger sinneth against his own soul. If you're stupid enough to provoke a king to anger then you are sinning against your own soul because you're just begging for the, uh, the response. And the response from a king, if you anger him, is not a good thing. It could be death. Could be. So the fear of a king is as the roaring of a lion. You do not want to mess with a roaring lion, do you? You also don't want to mess with with a king have be wise and have a healthy fear of the king and don't provoke him to anger or he is going to hurt you okay in verse three it is an honor for a man to cease from strife now i know that when you get into it with people it's hard to let it go when they just keep on and keep on and keep on. But it says it's an honor to cease from strife. So if you have the ability to do that, and God doesn't give everyone the ability to do that. If you have the ability to do it and you have eyes to see and ears to hear, cease from strife. Zip the lips. It says every fool will be meddling. A fool just keeps throwing a fuel on the fire. And you know what? A fire that you continue to put fuel on is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. It's not going to be put out. Instead, zip your lips and that is the equivalent to throwing water on it. And it will go away. You can cease from strife. It is an honor for a man to cease from strife. So it's not one of those deals where you're a wimp if you cease from strife. It's where you're smart <laughs> and you get honor because you cease from strife. Okay? But every fool will be meddling. Every single fool out there in your path 
is going to just metal, 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 and keep trying to fire things up. In verse 4, the sluggard will not plow by, the, by reason of the cold. He's like, oh, it's too cold out there. I don't want to plow. Oh, we're live on Periscope, YouTube, and Facebook. Excellent. The sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore shall he beg in harvest and have nothing. If you don't get out there and pay your dues and plow the field and plant it and everything when it's time to do that, even though you might get a little cold, you are not going to have anything to eat when the harvest comes. And you're going to be a beggar to other people, and there is no honor in being a beggar. Uh, I mean, I, I would rather starve, okay, than beg anybody for help. I won't do it. I won't do it. I won't do it. Um, God takes care of me. And if he doesn't, then I won't be taken care of. That's just how it is. And we're going to talk some more about, you know, some things here in a little while. Um, in verse 5, counsel in the heart of man is like deep water. When you give wise counsel, or counsel, whether wise or foolish, it says counsel in the heart of man is like deep water. You're not sure how they're going to receive it. You're not sure how deep those waters are. You're not, but a man of understanding will draw it out. If you have understanding and the gift of counsel, see, that's one of the seven spirits before the throne of God. Shown to us in Revelation 1, 4, and named for us in Isaiah 11, 2. Okay? So, a, a man of understanding can draw it out and counsel someone and help them figure out what is the best thing to do. But secular, I'll tell you something. Secular counseling is, um, uh, what's the word I want to use? Um. A poodoo. <laughs> okay. Secular counseling can, um, can, can a lot of times make it worse if you're a believer. Okay. If you're, if you're not a believer, then that's by all means go to a secular counselor. But if you are a believer, it's better that you're not counseled by a secular counselor because their idea of you being better in here, in your heart, and in your mind is different than what God has in mind if you're a believer. And it's substandard. If you have, uh, if you're counseled by a Christian counselor, it's way better. <laughs> and you'll end up with hope when you're concluded. In verse 6, most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. But a faithful man who can find. I'm not sure I know any. What can I say? Um, I know that we have wonderful brothers in the Lord on uh, on my wall and that come to the show, but faithful. And no, nobody is perfect. Nobody is going to be able to find someone that's completely faithful 100% of the time. And I'm not talking about faithful to your vows. I'm talking about being faithful to where they don't say anything derogatory about you behind your back, you know, things like that that just happen in a normal conversation where, you know, a woman will say to her friend, oh, man, he's gripey today. Or, you know, he's really uh, on the warpath today. You're, you're, you know, he may interpret that as a betrayal to him, uh, you know, but I don't see it that way. If you just comment on how, you know, somebody's gripey today, that's just a fact, but, but it, do you see what I'm saying? I'm not totally faithful then either, am I? Because I, if I, if I, if I say, wow, you know, my husband's having a bad day, um, I don't think I want to talk to him. 
then that makes me not faithful, doesn't it? So none of us are going to be perfect, okay? But we we want to try to be. We want to try to be. In verse 7, the just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. The just man is one who righteousness is important to him. He is a child of God, and he cares about justice. Justice is important to him. So he walks in integrity, and he has to be careful not to become pious or self-righteous. Okay? Because if you're walking in integrity, and you're obeying the word, and you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, then you have to fight with self-righteousness and a proud look at other people. You don't want to judge others as um, as being any less in the Lord than you are or any less close to him than you are. Just because you walk with him every day, uh, you know, he's no respecter of persons, okay? His children are blessed at, after him. It's good for your children to be blessed after you. So it's worth walking in, an, in your integrity for the blessings that it will bring the children. In verse 8, A king that sitteth in the throne of judgment scattereth away all evil with his eyes. And what this is saying, when a king is sitting on his throne of judgment, evil is going to hightail it out of there. Okay? And evil will not look him in the eye. And they will, they would rather just not be there. In verse 9, who can say, I have made my heart clean, I am pure from my sin? Well, let's look at that. Who can say, I have made my heart clean? Nobody. <laughs> Not a single living soul. Um, we don't make our heart clean. Jesus does. He does that. Okay. I am pure from my sin. Yes, our sins are bought and paid for, but we didn't do that ourselves. The Savior did it for us. In verse 10, diverse weights, which means unusual or not common, not standard uh, weights, and diverse measures, both of them are alike abomination to the Lord. If you are cheating people and messing with your scales, uh, let's say you're selling produce and you mess with your scales so that um, it says a pound when it's, you know, um, five-eighths of a pound. The God hates that. He hates that because you're a thief. You're ripping people off. <clears throat> In verse 11. Sorry. <laughs> I'm still fighting this stuff. I'm taking my antibiotic, but it's killing my shoulder. This antibiotic is what's killing my shoulder. Even a child is known by his doings, verse 11. Whether his work be pure and whether it be right. So even children are known by their doings. Are they lying their little butts off? Or are they telling the truth? Are they considerate of others or are they selfish? Okay. Even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure and whether it be right. In verse 12, one of my very favorites that I tend to give you, um, the hearing ear and the seeing eye. The Lord hath made even both of them. The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord hath made even both of them. You know what that means? When you look in Revelation chapter 3 and you see where it says, and in a lot of other places in the Word, when it says, those who have ears to hear, let him hear. Okay? If you have an ear to hear, it's because God gave it to you. Now, I put on my wall something that is pretty profound if you've caught it. It is that we 
the fear, we come before the Lord with fear and trembling. Okay? Fear and trembling. What that means is reverence and respect. Okay? You don't have to cower in a corner and shake, you know, and shiver. Reverence and respect. If God has not chosen to start teaching you yet, then you have not learned the lessons, the very first ones you have to learn. Reverence and respect. The first commandment, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy mind, all thy strength. That is the first and greatest commandment. Okay? And how do you, I mean, you can't love him unless he allows you to get to know him. Now you can love good. You can love righteousness and all the children of God do. Loving God is getting to know him. And he's wonderful. He's completely just. You love good. You love righteousness. You're also going to love the Lord your God. And the wicked can't get past that first commandment. They can't love him. And religion, I mean, it's wreckage. How can you love the Lord your God if you think he's going to fry you uh, when you make a mistake? You can't. The way you love him is in response. Not, in, not you loving him first. He said he loved you first. Okay. We love God because he first loved us. So if you, uh, if you start comprehending how much you are loved and how God is not going to fry you, you're his child, he loves you, he died for you, he's not going to fry you because you're slow to learn or going through a phase of disobedience. Would you do that to your children? Would you uh, destroy them because they're slow to learn or going through a phase of disobedience? Uh, of course you wouldn't. So why are we so anxious to believe that God would do that? Uh, it just, it's crazy, isn't it? We shouldn't believe that he would be willing to do that. He wouldn't. Why would he nullify his sacrifice? He wouldn't. The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord hath made even both of them. So don't worry if your family members and loved ones haven't been called to learn yet. Uh, they'll learn in the millennium. You know, they'll learn. They're still children of God, born with a temple inside them, whether they have been called to learn again uh, already or not. If they haven't learned yet, they'll learn in the millennium and be brought back still alive. In verse 13 of Proverbs chapter 20, Love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Now, uh, <clears throat> there's a difference in loving to take a nap because you're tired, okay? And just loving to sleep your life away so much as an escape so you don't have to live it. You will come to poverty. If you sleep your life away, open thine eyes and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. Get off your blessed assurance and get out there and support your family. Get a job. In verse 14, it is not, it is not, saith the buyer. But when he has gone his way, then he boasted. <coughs> <coughs> Have you ever... Um, let's say you go into the dollar store, right? And they've got something that they want $5 for. Or even a garage sale or whatever. But it's got, they say, oh, well, it's got a string on it. It's got a string loose or it's missing a button or whatever. When they just pulled the button off and it's in their pocket, okay? Um, it's missing a button, so I want a discount. They say, oh, no, no, that's not worth $5. Not worth $5. Missing a button. And so they get a discount on it because they're being dishonest. 
And then when they go their way, they are patting themselves on the back and boasting about how smart they were. No, you're dumb. Okay. <laughs> if that's how you do things, you're not very smart at all. You want to give people a fair price. You know, I mean, do you have to haggle to a point where you rip people off? No, you don't. In verse 15, there is gold and a multitude of rubies, but the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. Lips of knowledge are worth more. Wisdom and knowledge are worth more than silver and gold and rubies in any precious gem. In verse 16, take his garment that is surely for a strange, surety for a stranger. Well, God tells you not to be surety for a stranger. Not It's not talking about your kid or your brother. It's talking about a stranger. Okay? And take a pledge of him for a strange woman. So if you don't know somebody, you take collateral if you're going to help them, is what it says. Take his garment that is surety for a stranger. Oh, actually, that's talking about somebody, let's say your neighbor down the street is your friend and you wants you to co-sign on a car for him. And then they don't pay the payment. Take his garment that is surety for a stranger. That means you go get the car because you're responsible to pay for it. If they don't live up to what they agreed to, don't let them just get out of it. You go and get the car and you drive it. And since you're having to pay for it anyway, okay. And take a pledge of him for a strange woman. If he, if your friend wants to, um, do, wants you to do something for a friend of his, don't do it without collateral. Okay. That's what that's saying. In verse 17, bread of deceit is sweet to a man. Uh, he thinks he's getting away with something and it's, it's exciting, exciting. But afterwards, his mouth shall be filled with gravel. He's going to wish he'd never gone there. Okay. Bread of deceit. Um, you know, what's that uh, saying? What a wick. What a wicked web we weave when first we practice to deceive. I think it's something like that. Don't deceive people. Children of God are not supposed to deceive people. And I know that we all do everything wrong, but God will give you the ability to have integrity in him if you just submit yourself, therefore, unto the Lord, resist the devil, and he will flee. That's a procedure, in case you didn't notice that. First thing you do is submit yourself, therefore, unto the Lord. Then, with the Lord driving, resist the devil, and he has to flee from Jesus. Okay? Now, um, in verse 18 of Proverbs 20, Every purpose is established by counsel, and with good advice make war. Don't make war because you're mad. You make war because it's the right thing to do or the or the good thing to do. Like if, you know, if you have uh, someone coming over into your country and blowing up your people, you go to war and you take them down. So every purpose is established by counsel. You can't declare war without the Congress and the Senate and the president and all these things. So you have to, uh, we have checks and balances where we go through various levels of counsel, uh, before we make war in verse 19. And you know how they got us to go on this war on terror. They killed 3000 Americans and play to your emotions about that. They want you to be angry, so you'll send our army over to Iraq and take down Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein, he's gone, though, thankfully. And I'm glad he's gone, 
but that was a big mistake to give them an open check for a war on terror that has no ending. No ending. In verse 19, he that goeth about as a talebearer revealeth secrets. Therefore meddle not with him that flattereth with his lips. Uh, meddle not with him that flattereth with his lips. Okay? Somebody comes and wants to be your friend and all they ever do is flatter you. Run the other way as fast as you possibly can. Troy, can we take a break here in about five minutes, please? <sighs> My shoulder. But I'm going to get through this. <clears throat> um, he that goeth about, this is 19 of chapter 20 in Proverbs. He that goeth about as a talebearer revealeth secrets. Therefore meddle not with him that flattereth with his lips. Um, Somebody who is who usually has nothing better to say than flatteries to you, uh, you can't trust them as far as you can throw them. Okay? In verse 20, Whoso curseth his father or his mother, his lamp shall be put out in, ex in obscure darkness. Don't curse your father or your mother. Okay? Take care of them and... Uh, like they took care of you, okay? And even if they weren't a good father or mother, you obey the Lord and take care of them anyway. His lamp shall be put out in obscure darkness. Well, that means it's not going to be very fun for you to transition into the kingdom, okay? In verse 21. Now, because see, right now during this time, we have all of those things going on. Our kids cursing us, disobeying, not receiving counsel, uh, rejecting wise counsel. They do wrong and they won't listen, a lot of them, okay? And they are under the blood, okay? The temple, the temple of God dwells in them and just because they're up to their eyeballs in sin, uh, everybody is. We're all sinners. We're all wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. All right. An inheritance may be gotten hastily at the beginning. Now, you might be really thrilled in the beginning to have an inheritance, but the end thereof shall not be blessed. Okay. If you have gotten it hastily at the beginning or, you know, manipulated your way into an inheritance or stolen an inheritance, but, you know, before your parents were ready to pass it on to you or whatever, but the end thereof shall not be blessed. <clears throat> It'll slip through your fingers like sand. And it, the end thereof shall not be blessed. In verse 22, say not thou, I will recompense evil, but wait on the Lord and he shall save thee. I love this one. Don't return evil for evil, but overcome evil with good. So don't recompense evil. Don't, don't pay back evil yourself. Don't try to get vengeance or justice yourself. Defer it to the king. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. You can't do it as good as him anyway. Let him do it. And if you don't let him do it, you um, you short yourself. Okay? Uh, you, It's like shooting yourself in the foot. In verse 23, diverse weights are an abomination unto the Lord. We've been talked, we've already uh, heard that. God says things several times through Solomon here, and uh, pay attention to anything he says more than once. Diverse weights, that means unusual or not standard, different than the norm. They are an abomination to the Lord. And a false balance is not good. It's not going to benefit you at all, even though you think you're being sneaky and coming out of heads, you're not. In verse 24, 
Man's goings are of the Lord. How can a man then understand his own way? Did you hear that? Man's goings are of the Lord. You just think you made all the decisions of your life. Your life was written before you ever stepped into your body. Man's goings are of the Lord. He has a plan and it is all carefully choreographed and uh, written in every detail, pre-written, and you are unable to deviate from what is written by him for your life. You can't deviate from it. So look at your life now and you think, ah, I'm a mess. Well, he has written you to be a mess because you're being tested to see, can you overcome being a mess? You have faith. Can you continue moving forward in Christ? We're going to take a real quick break. Don't go away. We'll be right back. In a blink, it happens in a flash, it happens in 